Hello and welcome to the Open Systems Media eCast, Enabling Embedded Security for the Internet of Things. I'm Kurt Schwader, your moderator, with today's speakers, Michelle Chabreau from Wind River and Marco Bloom from Weibo Systems. Today's schedule consists of about 50 minutes of presentation, leaving 10 minutes at the end of the hour for audience Q&A. Before we begin, I'd like to run down some features of your viewing console. First is the Enlarge Slides button. This button will maximize the slides to fill your entire screen. The Download Slides button allows you to download and print the slides if you'd like a hard copy to follow along with. The button labeled Forward to a Friend enables you to send an email to someone that will include a registration link to this eCast so they can also attend. The Ask a Question text box enables you to participate in today's event. You can simply type your question into the box and submit it using the Submit button. You can submit questions at any time during the presentation. We encourage you to do so early and often while you're looking at the material and the question is fresh in your mind. We'll address as many of these as we can during the closing Q&A. And if you have a question pertaining to the eCast operation itself, you can submit those too. And one of our technicians will be happy to respond to you during the eCast. There will also be a poll during the presentation. When you see this poll pop up on your screen, you simply select the button next to your answer and hit the Submit button. Uh, we appreciate that you do that, and uh, that will be an interesting part of the uh, event as well. Michel Chabreau is a Senior Product Manager at Wind River, where he covers the VxWorks real-time operating system, including its core kernel and a portfolio of industry-specific and technology add-on profiles. An embedded industry and Wind River veteran for over 14 years, Michelle has had multiple roles with the company, spanning from engineering to technical account management to product management. Michelle holds a master's degree in computer science, engineering, and management. Marco Bloom joins him today. He is the product R&D manager for the embedded system space at Weibo and focuses on protection and license management of embedded systems. He's responsible for a use of code meter in embedded systems and industrial controllers. Marco has a long history in certificate-based license management, money recognition, and platform security systems for automated teller machines. He's also spent some time in the IT security operations space as well while at Wincore Nixdorf. Michelle will be kicking things off today. Michelle, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kurt. Well, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. So again, as, as uh, Kurt said, my name is Michelle Chabrouim, and I'm product manager at Wind River. So today we're going to uh, go ahead and uh, talk about security. So uh, security in general uh, can be uh, a very interesting topic. So we do have a, um, an agenda today that's going to be somewhat packed. So first off, what I'm going to do is talk about uh, VxWorks, just give you a very small overview of VxWorks, where, where it is and what it's all about. Then I'll tell you a little bit of, of a story around security and why this matters today. Uh, Marco will uh, then take the lead and give you a, a hint, um, hints around why security, uh, the kind of security threats we are uh, seeing today. And then we're gonna, I'm going to go back and talk about our security profile of VxWorks, what it's all about. And finally, um, Marco will talk about the enhancements that Weibo provides on top of our security profile to make it uh, an industry-hardened uh, uh, solution. With that said, let's look at a little story. So um, this uh, seems like a, a, a funny thing to, to look at uh, from a Windows standpoint, but uh, VxWorks itself uh, has been used for, for many, many years. So it's today the most widely used operating system. Uh, I was told, and I'm not the one counting, there are about 2 billion devices uh, today running VxWorks. Uh, we got a large partner ecosystem. Uh, Weibo uh, is one of these partners, and uh, we are striving to actually work with our partner more and more as uh, things go by. Uh, we want to integrate their, their solution, and today with security, uh, Weibo is definitely um, one of these use cases. VxWorks is still a, a highly performant, highly scalable RTOS, and with the, the advent of version 7, uh, we've had a very strong focus on safety and security, and obviously security is why you, uh, you are here today. Also, uh, virtualization is becoming a, a predominant topic, and this is a nice complement to um, the actual safety and security uh, story. 
Now, um, you'll see this title, you know, what does air conditioning really and uh, identity theft have in common? So that story is a true story. And it's not just for the sake of it that we're going over it. It's just because it is highly pertinent to uh, the solutions that we are providing today and um, how VxWorks can help you there. So let me go over it, if you don't mind. So uh, names have been withheld, uh, obviously, but this is actually a, an absolute true story. So um, there was once a big box a retail shop during the holiday season that was selling all kinds of stuff. And because it's the holiday season, uh, they want to make sure their customers are comfy and everything. So obviously, there's air conditioning running everywhere, and everybody's happy, right? One day, there's a problem with the air conditioning, uh, the HVAC system somewhere, and that particular retailer decides to call on their um, HVAC contractor. Here's what happens, though. It's all nice and clean, but this HVAC uh, company was hacked. Somebody uh, got into the company, and for some reason, whether it was intended or not at the beginning, they managed to get access to network passwords uh, that were used by this contractor to access the network of the big retail store. Once they got access to this password, they were able to get into the network of that big retail store. And what they decided to do is, hey, let's install some stuff in there, and we'll try to get access to the point of sales machines. And they did. So all the things that they did install at the end were there to collect data. So it was not, the intent was not to damage or, you know, break something in there. It was to collect data. So they wanted to collect not any data, they wanted to collect credit card information. And so they did collect a lot of credit card information because as I mentioned earlier, this was done around the holiday season. So uh, black market retail value for credit card varies between you know, $10 and, and $40 depending on how uh, fresh they are, if you will. And therefore, uh, when you multiply that by millions, you can get a whole uh, a large kind of cash of uh, uh, in, in selling this information to the black market. So the moral of the story at the end is that, well, in the past, we looked at things and we didn't really worry about it. Today, when you connect devices, all of them need to be connected and secured in a way that prevents third party from looking at it. So. Uh, at the end of the day, you can't really prevent somebody from using weak passwords. But having a, a global security solution and uh, approach to everything will help, uh, will prevent these things from happening in the near future. So this is really just some, some kind of background. Uh, we're going to look at some of the details uh, in, a, in, in a few minutes. But before we go ahead, I would like to ask you uh, to answer that poll, if you don't mind. It is really, how would you describe your level of knowledge in securing an embedded device, right? We kind of want to understand where you sit. Uh, we know some of you are going to be experts, so you, you're pretty much your security expert or security architect. You might have some experience because you deal with it or you might have pretty much no experience whatsoever. You're just kind of learning about it. Um, so if you would be so kind as to uh, give us your, your answer here, we're going to wait a, a few seconds here, and then we're going to look at, you know, um, the results. So, so that everybody can see, um, we do have mostly um, uh, unexperienced engineers or folks here, uh, but a, a large chunk of our, our audience today has some experience, which is very nice. So now I will let Marco uh, go over some of the threats and um, other items that you see uh, when it comes to security. So let me say first uh, 
Good morning or good evening here from Germany. Thanks, Michelle, for the introduction. So I have now the topic um, which I called who needs security and why. So we just heard uh, Michelle's story about the air condition system. And that's really, it's a lifelike example how an attacker can access um, a network which is which you mean it is secure because you use a firewall, you use a VPN connection. And um, so you have the feeling it is safe. But um, even if, if every access point in a network has a state-of-the-art security, then still remember you are locked into a computer of an air condition. And this computer is connected to an internal network. And are you sure that, that the controller of an air condition, or take another example, uh, whatever, an emergency diesel generator, or just uh, the internet radio of uh, any employee is really designed for security? I think not. It's not the core competence of the manufacturer. So let's move from the building automation to, uh, to the production facilities view. So in, in a modern factory, you have machines or, or systems which are now transforming to cyber-physical systems. Um, yeah, it's a new buzzword. And I had a look in, in the English Wikipedia, and it brings it on a, in a nutshell. So uh, that's why I've written in it uh, on the slide. Cyber-physical system means it's a combination of a network, computer-based system, and the good old hardware, here called uh, a physical entity meaning all these uh, stuff, electronic, computer, and mechanic, are growing together. So remember the old hardwired legacy system with, um, with a hardwired logic. Then it was replaced by PLCs a few years later. And now the latest trend is you link all these island systems, which in, in former times had no connection from one island to the other, to one big called cyber-physical system. And that's, uh, this, this spreading network communication opens for you as a user lots of new opportunities. That's why you're doing that. But all these opportunities also result in new attack vectors. So let's have a look into the different security threats and uh, the views of the main stakeholders. So one of the stakeholders is uh, the manufacturer of a system. This might be a vendor of a PLC or of a controller or of a component. But uh, the manufacturer can also be um, an equipment manufacturer who's building turning machines or even the constructor of a complete plant. And the, um, the second stakeholder is the operator. I call it the operator or your customer or the plant owner. It's the guy who uses this system for, um, for his business. So let's have a look at the, um, of, uh, at the security threats of the manufacturer. So um, he must prevent himself from cloning the machine or imitation of a machine, meaning uh, reverse engineering. Another big issue is manipulation to the uh, log files, to the log di data, for example, for warranty reasons. He must be sure that all his log files are uh, still um, the same as the machine has written it, so meaning integrity. And he also wants to prevent unauthorized access to source code, for example. And we also had discussions with customers or uh, even with security authorities who show that the copying of machines and reverse engineering is one of the biggest threats for the manufacturers. Let's have a look to uh, the interest of the operator. So um, there was a survey from the VDMA, that's uh, a German industry association, and this survey showed up that uh, sabotage and human mistakes is one of the top security threats in companies. That was um, a survey only in Germany, but I think you can copy it to the U.S. and to nearly any other country. And the majority of security incidents have an internal origin. External is only about 20%. 
um, so that's why I've written here one of the uh, threats is um, sabotage, human mistakes, or even uh, one big issue, displeased employees. And leaving this um, criminal part, the operator has also an interesting that his intellectual property like recipes or the configuration data or produced amounts of, of um, pieces, for example, are still his uh, intellectual property and he wants to protect this data. These are the main threats. The list uh, can be extended as long as you want to, but these are the, the main issues. So when, when, when we go on with this term definition, we can reduce all these needs from the last slide to these four um, core objectives. The first one is copy protection. The word speaks for himself. Uh, it's protection against copying, against reproduction of the complete machine. Just copy the control program, use it on another machine, and you have a copy of the machine. The next thing is IP protection. You want to protect your software, your uh, libraries, or your PLC program against reverse engineering. Then we have the issue integrity. You want to make sure that uh, the program or the configuration um, is, is um, prevented to, to be manipulated or um, modified just by, by uh, employees or by whomever. And the last thing, authenticity, means that you want to be sure that every line of code comes from a trustworthy origin. So these are the, the main objectives when talking about software protection, for example. And we have realized this all by the use of standard cryptographic methods. There's no proprietary uh, functionality or cryptographic functions in there. And it's, it's all based on standards. The art of using these standards is the implementation in the environment and to design um, a user-friendly interface. That's what we did, and now uh, Michelle will tell you how we did it for basic security. Thanks, Marco. So, so that's a very good segue. At the end of the day, the, the four main threats, if you will, that Marco has identified, you know, the security objective, I should say, this, to be absolutely clear, the copy protection, IP protection, uh, integrity verification, and authentication are actually four big stuff, blocks, if you will, that need to be addressed. And so we work with Weibo to address m most of them, if not all of them, uh, in our security profile for VxWorks. So what is the security profile? So it's an add-on to our VxWorks 7 platform that, bring in, that brings in some of these newer uh, software components to address these objectives. So from a, from a packaging standpoint, it's compatible with uh, our VxWorks 7 core platform and the various industrial profile that we have, such you know, uh, market-specific profiles such as industrial, medical, et cetera. And this is why we wanted to partner with Weibo. So Weibo has these hardware devices that can augment the security solution we have in software to make it even more bulletproof if a software implementation is not enough. So, in essence, you get everything you need to, um, to look at the security aspect within, from a software point of view with the ability to augment it with a hardware solution. So now, when we look at the security profile for VxWorks, what, what really are the benefits? So again, it's a foundation. So our security profile is what I would call a live piece of software in the sense that we are assessing newer functionality. We can add them. We can, you know, change some of the configuration, such as you. I mean, it's, it's a fully configurable piece of software. You do not have to use all the bits. You do not necessarily need all of them. And again, you can upgrade to the next version whenever it comes up. And, you know, so it, it gives you a, a very, uh, very good starting point to securing actual devices. So now here's what's interesting. So when we look at the software design, um, there are, and the, the life cycle of the software in Embedded, we see four different bucks, four different categories of operations. So the first one is booting. 
We want to make sure that what boots is what's what's supposed to boot. Uh, if you have, you know, a uh, you know a controller, let's say an nuclear power plant, and this controller is supposed to do something, you want to make sure that the software that comes up is the one that you had designed. Now, the second aspect is we look at operation. Operation is runtime. It's really the runtime aspect, making sure that if you load any application, uh, mind you, in some instances, it doesn't apply because there are no applications loaded at runtime. But if you do load application, you want to verify exactly like when you booted the device that the code that's being loaded is authentic. So with that, we also have you know, the same concept, uh, digital signature and uh, decryption, and I'll go back to that in a few minutes. And we also add a concept of user management. Um, exactly, if you will, like when you have in some of these uh, bigger operating systems, like Linux or Windows, where you log in with a username and password, we do have in VxWorks now the ability to provide advanced user management with permissions. Um, and again, we'll talk about this in a few minutes. Now, the, four, the third uh, aspect of the life cycle of a system is data transmission. Whenever data comes in and out, you want to make sure that this data is protected so that not everybody can look at it. And obviously, that includes support for uh, encryption standards and you know, uh, communication standards, uh, secure communication standards like OpenSSL. Finally, one of the, the, uh, the last aspects is what happens when the device has been powered off? It might, it might sound that it doesn't really matter, and in some cases it might not. But in some others, you might have some data on the device, any kind of data. If, you, if you're building a medical device uh, under the uh, HIPAA uh, rules, you have to make sure that all patient data is protected, non-identifiable uh, data, and also, technically, you're supposed to encrypt them. So for that, we wanted to make sure that if you have any form of data, it's never in the clear on your actual device. Okay, so mechanically, how does that work? So we have our first, first aspect, again, is the secure loading. We want to make sure that whatever loads is what was supposed to load. And that goes back to some of the security objectives that Marco mentioned. Uh, making sure you protect your IP and you authenticate the binary. So IP protection uh, can be uh, assimilated to reverse engineering. And I have a customer here in Southern California. This is exactly what happened to them. Somebody lifted their software, uh, took it, changed it a little bit to put their name and logo, and put the software on the clone of the hardware. Uh, it's a medical company, and that's where we'll stop. So our secure loader... Uh, today uh, is going to, on Intel, we are almost done doing the ARM part, but on Intel, we can have, a, we have a proprietary trusted EFI module that will verify the digital signature of the binary, which, which is VxWorks, the VxWorks image, which is signed from our, uh, from our workbench tools. And in turn, if the signature has been considered valid, we lo will enable loading of, of our application, which will also be checked against their signature. When you decide to enable digital signature, it's a, it's a null inclusive. You can no longer use unsigned binaries. And so that actually addresses the authentication of binaries. You make sure that the binaries that are, that are running are the ones you intended to see running. The other aspect is encryption. So you can also encrypt these binaries so that when you look at them, they just look like a blob. And there's no way you could actually try to reverse engineer or modify the code because obviously if you try to modify it, then you, know, you won't be able to re-encrypt them in a proper fashion. Okay? So the concept of digital signature has been added for uh, VxWorks. And now we have in our workbench a tool that allows you to digitally sign very simply all the binaries you provide. So uh, it's ECC-based. And you'll have some kind of a lead engineer, the security owner, if you will. So, some of you might have a dedicated person. Uh, some of you might look at it in a more open fashion. But you will generate your root key and your certificate, sign everything for your developers, and then provide all the appropriate data for the developers to, in turn, generate the binaries 
that are uh, signed and ready to be used on a target. So that addresses the authenticity of your binaries. Now, against IP protection, we want to be able to encrypt binaries. So we're using AES. So again, uh, Marco mentioned it earlier, these are all standard. So nothing, it's not like we invented any voodoo magic encryption uh, routines. It's all done through standards. So again, from the Winover workbench, you can easily encrypt your binaries and generate an equivalent image that would be loaded only if uh, the encryption is, the decryption, I'm sorry, is successful, okay? So this, this was really adding the boot, boot time and operations uh, uh, verification of binaries. I mentioned earlier that at runtime, you might want to provide access to some users to the system. Maybe if we, if we think about our, this HVAC system, maybe somebody logs into the system um, and wants to have you know, access to some data. Mind you, as the device manufacturer, you might not want to provide all permissions to the operator. So you would create a user and password for yourself, as such as the device manufacturer, but provide a different level of privilege to the operator. Uh, he or she might only be able to do some predefined function testing or diagnosis or whatever you imagine, and they would have to call you instead of just giving them permissions to do everything. Again, that functionality is optional, but if enabled, every access to a VxRock 7 based device will require a username and password. Obviously, that's, that feature is only as good as the password uh, that you use. If you use your date of birth, uh, obviously this is, you know, this is not going to protect you very much, okay? So in terms of data transmission, I will not elaborate too much uh, in the sense that we use uh, very well-known uh, application and standards like OpenSSL, et cetera, for, for all the encryption. But I want to address the uh, functionality around uh, encrypted containers. So uh, what we have decided to do is to use the technology that was put together uh, by this little program called TrueCrypt. And TrueCrypt actually uh, was a free program, a cross-platform, that was generated containers uh, protected using various forms of well-known algorithms, AES, Serpent, Two Fish, combinations of all. And somehow, uh, earlier this year, there was a kind of a, a splash announcement on their website saying, oh, we've been hacked and, you know, you know the world ends, uh, we're done. We have not used TrueCrypt. So our implementation is not TrueCrypt. What we decided to use is the file format. So the implementation for the TrueCrypt container in VxWorks is a sound implementation. Uh, despite the fact that TrueCrypt had been audited by a cybersecurity expert and they did not find anything to, you know, uh, worrisome, to put it this way. So we can create now in VxWorks our own containers. You can store them in any kind of file system. And what that means is that no data is ever in the clear uh, at runtime. The other functionality we thought might be useful is that while you might just want to use passphrase that are you know, as they are, we've added the ability to completely customize the encryption and obfuscation of the passphrase, enabling you to leverage maybe some hardware and other functionality. Okay, so now uh, we have actually worked with Weibo, and this is really where it, I think it comes in the picture. The security profile is a software-based uh, implementation of security uh, libraries, right? And so Weibo has this unique technology that allows, it to, allows you to use hardware and it complements it. So this is really the, the reason all, this, all that is in the security profile is software only. And everything that if you need to have hardware support or advanced hardware support, uh, you will be able to enhance this, this application with the Weibo implementation, okay? <laughs> Before, before we go into the, the actual uh, technical advantages of the hardware-based solution, I wanted to talk about two use cases. 
Uh, again, I will not you know, provide names, but we've had some customers in, in various industries, and uh, one of these customers works in the uh, energy distribution business. And so their, their main problems around security is to prevent operation disruptions um, in a sense that they don't want somebody to hack into the system causing possible power outages or uh, damage to the infrastructure. You might think it's far-fetched. You know, who would go into a company like, I don't know, Southern California Edison or PG&E and try just to create power outage for no apparent reason? Well, there's, there's apparently uh, a belief that uh, terrorist organizations are trying to do these kind of things, and that would cause a serious disruption in the country. Um, so, mind you, these, these people are uh, concerned about it and want to make sure that they uh, are securing the devices. So they want to protect against hacking, against tampering, because you have some of these street boxes, you know, there's nobody to look at them at night. It could be easy to just open one of these street boxes, replace some of the software and gain access to something uh, and doing something, you know, um, uh, that would be damaging. So mechanically, they want to use encryption to protect their binaries. They, will, they are going to sign their binary, making sure everything is signed, uh, adding advanced user management to really have various roles and provide secure remote access. Uh, the hardware security, base security, is an option, and this is something they're contemplating, but this is in evaluation at this point uh, today. So that's the first use case. The second use case I kind of alluded to is uh, medical companies. Um, again, this is a, a, a live, true use case. We had a customer here who um, saw suddenly some of its customers calling for support asking for support in some machines because some stuff didn't work very well, and they realized that the hardware had been cloned. It was just a cheap clone of their, their existing machine, and the software had been lifted off of the original and put on, on the fake one, by just, and it also just changed the logos and a few bitmaps and, and text being displayed. So uh, these medical companies want to also do the same thing. They want to protect from tampering, uh, with the device itself, so making sure that uh, you encrypt the device protected with digital signatures. In that particular use case, some patient data was tr uh, in transit on the device and needed to be se secured as well. So they had their own protocol to do that, and they were compliant, but they realized that using encrypted container would definitely help just as an overall policy protect the data in, in the system. So at the end of the day, you know, security applies to all kinds of industries. And so if the software is not enough, if like some of these companies were, I, I just mentioned, want, you guys want to go further, you might want to give a call to uh, our partners at Weibo and um, look at their code meter uh, enhancement on top of our v VxWorks work security profile. Okay, Marco? I'll let you take it away on, on the hardware-based uh, kilometer security solution. Okay, thank you, Michel. Um, yeah, we just heard about uh, the implementation we um, made together with Wind River for uh, the software-based security approach. Um, maybe you have some additional requirements or um, want to go further with your security implementation. One thing, Michelle already uh, stated it, is maybe you want to like the hardware-based key store, so um, not only the implementation in, in software, or uh, you get one big function with the code meta security, which is, uh, for example, license management, which enables you to uh, drive new business models. Think about uh, network licenses or uh, trial licenses or things like pay-per-use models or just a limitation of the uh, lot size, so the amount of, of pieces a machine can produce. Or think about leasing models. All these are business models which can be implemented using this uh, code meta security. 
And even we have this uh, program called License Central, which I will explain later on, um, which is able to manage all these licenses, uh, manage the rollout of licenses and so on. But uh, let us start um, with the hardware-based dongle solution. So um, you might know dongles from PC programs like CUT software or expensive music producing software and, and stuff like that. And we have ported this technology uh, to the industry or to embedded systems. So meaning that uh, the first step was to have all different form factors to be able to uh, cover the needs of even uh, old PLCs or embedded PCs up to uh, new systems or even to uh, customize specific systems. That's from the single ASIC over micro SD, SD cards, CF cards, up to USB dongles in different form factors. All these um, code meta dongles, which are uh, based on the smart card chip. And this means uh, independent from the form factor, the functionality is the same. So you can use uh, in, in one PLC the micro SD, in the other one the USB dongle, and in the third you have the ASIC, and you can use the same software implementation as the dongle um, is compatible to, to each other implementation. So um, the USB dongles and the SD card form factors are also able to be upgraded with uh, flash memory. So this is an, an industrial SLC flash. That is the, uh, the better version of the two flash families, uh, which is quite fast and um, covers the needs of, of industrial um, um, the, covers the industrial needs with lots of read and write cycles and so on. And one more advantage, if you use the USB dongles, you have the possibility to connect them as an HID device. Why only the USB dongles? That's easy. HID device only works for, uh, for USB. HID means it is the USB uh, language which is used by uh, keyboards, uh, mouse, trackballs, and, and controllers like that. That means you then have uh, no access to file systems. It's, uh, it's a kind of security reason why people say, okay, if you use a USB stick, then I like that uh, this stick uh, communicates it as HID to be sure that no uh, virus or other malware can be uh, transported to my embedded system. So it might be that you don't want to have or you cannot or, or what reason or um, there is, you do not want to have a hardware dongle. And um, you want to have the license models I talked about before, like uh, testing licenses, lot limitation, and so on. But you say no dongles for my system, it's uh, um, yeah, it's not needed, it's too expensive, it, it fits not because there's no, um, no connector or whatever, then you can use Code Meta Act. It is still, or it is again a software-based solution, but this uh, Act container is bound to um, the fingerprint of the target system. Fingerprint means in the best case, you have a TPM chip on the system and you use the TPM chip to bound our license to the TPM chip. In embedded systems, usually you have no TPM chip. That means you have to bind to uh, numbers like a serial number of CPU, of GPU, of uh, hard disk, and whatever you have. You just uh, take as many amounts from the environment as you can and then create a fingerprint, bind the license to the fingerprint, and that is your copy protection. So it's, um, it's a big cryptographic issue to break this kind of license. So when using ACT license, you have the same features as when, when using dongles, even with the um, difference, the one is software-based, the other one is a smart card. Yeah, the last two slides have shown uh, where you can store the licenses, dongles, act licenses, and both of these are uh, stored on your protected device. But now, um, 
you you uh, need a backend system. You have to manage the licenses. To, you have to transport the licenses to your customer, and all this uh, you you have to do in a convenient way, even with maximum security. You don't want that anybody can uh, do a man in the middle attack and and catch the license and use it for himself or whatever you can imagine of uh, attack vector for this. And all this uh, can be covered by the license central. So it's your connector between your own CRM or ERP system on the one side, and on the other side, it provides uh, a transport to, to the destination system to your customer. So I talked about uh, business models, new business models, new opportunities when using uh, the code meta functionality. For example, you create a license uh, with a time or with a counter limitation. You have a customer who wants to test your software or your, your hardware or uh, whatever you produce, and you say, okay, here you get the full functional uh, version of my product, and it works for 90 days. And there is no chance to manipulate these days, even not with uh, manipulation to the system clock or, or things like that. All these thoughts you have at first, uh, we already had, and uh, this is blocked. It will not work. So uh, if the customer then buys the product after this uh, test, uh, test phase, he just gets an update for his uh, certificates, and then he has the complete full functional software without any changes, without any updates, upgrades, or whatever. Or for stuff like that, just think about leasing models. Just having a counter, you lease, um, uh, for example, a turning machine, and it is able to produce an amount of 10,000 pieces a month. And if it's more, then you have to pay a higher leasing rate, for example. And then to implement a solution like this, you need a very secure counter. And this counter uh, is implemented in uh, the code meta chipset or uh, in the ACT license. Or another use case, you uh, deliver one software package, and then um, you just yeah, you, you always deliver the same package, and you just enable the functions the customer has uh, has bought, and only the functions he really needed. And um, for example, later on the customer comes and needs one more function, maybe one more access for a robot arm then he just gets an update to his license, and then uh, he has upgraded from four to six access, for example. And for you, all this without uh, new testing new software, without the certification stuff, and all these problems you have if you have different versions of software. So just have one standard product, and then just enable the um, functions you need. So, the um, license central, how does it work? Will the slide come? So, ah, okay. Sorry. Um, so, how does uh, license central work? You have this, uh, this um, plan here, and on the left side, you have the manufacturer. It's uh, the manufacturer of a secure component. In the middle where cloud is, it is the license central. It might be in the cloud. It might be on your notebook. It might be hosted by yourself. Besides your ERP system, that's not important. But it's also possible to have it in the cloud. And on the right side, you have the user with a secure component. So in step one, the manufacturer sells an item uh, and his ERP system um, that might also be SAP, Salesforce, Oracle, whatever, tells it to um, the license central. The license central then creates a ticket, which is um, posted here as an example uh, at number three. So this kind of ticket can be transferred to uh, the user, to your customer, maybe via email, uh, or um, just as a letter, whatever you want. He enters this uh, ticket number in his system, and then the protected system creates a certificate request, 
which is bound to the fingerprint of the system which is requesting. So, uh, meaning this request is an encrypted file which is sent uh, to the license central. And you can do this via email, via web upload. There are uh, different kinds of connectors how to transfer these files to the license central. And um, once the file is in license central, it will automatically be generated to an update file for your ACT container or Kudmeter stick. And this file, again, is then transferred to the user. Again, over insecure message ways, like email, like whatever you want. Because the file is encrypted, it is bound to the hardware, to uh, the fingerprint. So even if somebody gets this file, it's no problem because he's not able to use it. It is uh, cryptographically bound to the requesting system. So just transfer it back, um, put it in your uh, controller, and that's it. Then it will work there, and you have uh, updated your license. So this is my last slide. And um, the question is, where can you get these solutions? So the security profile of a software-based solution, which uh, Michelle has um, presented, is distributed by the, uh, Wind River. And if you want to upgrade to the dongle-based or CodeMeter Act licenses or need license central, then this is distributed by Vibu Systems. In both ways, we have um, a simple plug-in for the workbench, um, a software package, a development kit, which is installed on your um, on your machine, and it's quite easy to use even one or the other solution. But uh, the Vivo solution even then needs the dongles and um, hardware security boxes and so on. Yeah, so I hope uh, we have inspired you to uh, go new ways in, in embedded security and have some new ideas what to do with this combination of VxWorks 7 and um, the Vivo code meta solution or even with the security pro profile. Okay, that's it from me. So I will pass back to um, Michelle or um, we'll take that over for uh, the Q&As. All right. Yep, we are to the Q&A portion of the event now. Uh, we do have a number of good questions coming in. Uh, please uh, continue to ask those through the duration so you can get uh, take advantage of our experts here on the line. Uh, let's start with Michelle. How would VxWorks protect against control injection attacks like Stuxnet? That's, that's a good question. Well, so um, – the Stuxnet thing was highly publicized, and they got help from the manufacturer of the the hardware. So that if you get help from the manufacturer, it makes it tricky. Um, for, from a from a, a mechanical standpoint, having digitally signed binaries and encrypted binaries for any form of firmware would definitely render that kind of tampering very very difficult. You would have to have access to the uh, keys that were used to sign the binaries. And technically, your private keys used for signing binaries should be very, very closely guarded. Uh, same for your encryption keys in this case. So it, it's not that VxWorks in and out of itself protects against that. As the, uh, the functionality provided with the security profile gives you the tools to make that very difficult. At the end of the day, um, you know, with unlimited money and resources, you can pretty much break into anything. Uh, realistically, when you, time is of the essence or, you know, it has to be strategic, this kind of method, encryption and digital signature, would be enough to, um, to prevent that. Okay, Marco, there's a question having to do with smart devices, but maybe they don't have a lot of security experience or focus. Is there some kind of a checklist? I mean, you've provided a little bit of that, but if, if someone's like making their device smart for the first time or meaning connected to the Internet, is there kind of a specific checklist they can follow to say, okay, these are the things I should be worried about now that this device is connected? Yes, you can, you can find different best practices, for example, on the Internet. It is not a vendor-specific part. This is, uh, yeah, it's standard best practices. At first, you sit down, you think about 
what kind of system do I prepare? What are the um, security threats? What might an attacker want? And um, what is the, um, the amount of cost to the result he gets? So at first, you just have to really think about what do I need, what do I want, and what is realistic. And there are different best practices. I just know the German ones where we would say um, there is a BSI, this is a German authority for IT security. I think in the US it's uh, maybe the NIST or uh, I think even NSA gives uh, best practices for stuff like that. So this would be the first step. And with the result of that, then you know exactly what you need, what you want to, and then uh, you can choose your solution, whether you need the um, software-based solution or whether you need licenses and, and talk to Vivo, for example. Okay. Uh, there's a couple of questions here uh, that I think uh, we'll start with Michelle and have Marco chime in as well about uh, commercial point-of-sale systems and what kind of uh, typical security uh, mechanisms they might have. And, and uh, in terms of point-of-sale specifically, is there – uh, any specific attack vectors that you should be worried about, and uh, how would the security profile for VxWorks have protected against that that kind of attack? Let's start with Michelle and then Marco. Uh, so, so that's a good question. At the, at the end, I wanted to go back there. So, realistically, the, the software itself does not prevent anything. It's the the proper use of IP blocks within the software. So. When we look at um, the particular use case of that uh, retailer, and I almost slipped the name, sorry, <laughs> um, uh, you know, you would have to have first to have a more a stronger approach to security. For example, the network password should not be uh, giving you access to the point of sale network. Uh, there first should have been disconnected system, and if they had to be connected, there should have been uh, in the POS system verification of where the traffic is coming from and, uh, you know, kind of block it. The second aspect is that uh, while VxWorks is, is wildly popular uh, and it uses many places, uh, it is still not a target of predilection for criminals to actually write, you know, malware and, and kind of, you know, uh, softwares that, that are there to to snoop and, and do other stuff. Mind you, if at the end, with the security profile, you leverage the IP blocks that are in there, especially around encryption, digital signature, and so on, then in, in, you render the ability to install anything kind of impossible. You could always agree argue that this could be done in any operating system, uh, but some operating systems are more prone to to having this kind of thing happening while some others do not. So when we look at the IP blocks, I'm not saying we can prevent everything, but we can render at different stages in a, in a process things to be uh, harder. Example, the data stored for credit cards in this particular instance were not on, they were pretty much in a standard database, not even encrypted, nothing. So if you had access to the database, you could just lift them out, do a select star from whatever that is, and pull out all the records. Um, so again, having the, the right IP blocks enables you to put them at the right place and render your system more secure. But a, a piece of software will not replace uh, a clever, secure design. When I looked at this, when I had the slides with our four uh, the four things we're looking at as a company, which is boot up, operation, transmission, data at rest. There's actually a fifth block that we as a company look at and uh, our customer also look at. It's the design of the system. When you, design, when you want your system to be secure, you have to design it with security in mind. It cannot be an afterthought. Oh, by the way, let's put a password on top of it. It's the same as adding a fancy padlock to a door that's a hollow core door that's made out of cardboard. You know, you can punch through the door. It's nice to have a nice big padlock, but you can go through the door by just kicking it. Okay? Right. So, so that, that's pretty much where we are. Okay. Uh, Marco, uh, how about uh, uh, code meter in terms of point-of-sale devices and what kind of things it shores up? I think it's... Um a quite easy answer. The first thing is um, 
having a secure boot will um, so a complete secure boot from the beginning from the UEFI until the um, until the application that would that would be uh, the first thing um, Coolmeta will will help you to um, have a really secure key store you can also include it in the secure boot process and um, implement a kind of state machine inside CodeMeter to be really sure that every process of the booting is signed and is properly loaded and not manipulated and so on. Um, this will help you for attacks which are not physical. If you have really, if you get in touch with the POS system and have um, uh, laboratory equipment, then things get worse. But it's the same as the answer from Michelle to the uh, Stuxnet issue before. Um, it depends on, on, on the amount of money you spend. But uh, to make a state-of-the-art secure component, start with a secure boot, uh, with a secure boot process, encrypt your software, and uh, then um, you have raised the, the level to attack systems like that. Okay. And in your opinion, uh, when is security based upon software only good enough, and where do you want to cross over in the use cases where uh, you want to enhance it with hardware? Uh, it's, it's, again, the same, um, the same issue as, as before. If I say, what do I have to protect? Um, what is um, the value of my protected device, what is the value of my intellectual property, and how big is the danger that somebody um, starts hacking me, uh, hacking or reverse engineering or whatever he wants. So you always have to see what do I have to pay to get a secure device and what would an attacker um, pay to attack my device. And that's also um, always the thing where you have to think about it. Um, if you have um, a very unique kind of software which does something really special where you have put in uh, years of, of um, development, then it's okay to pay money for a secure solution, have a hardware-based dongle, and um, raise the, the, the level very high. If you just have um, an amount of, of um, volume uh, hardware which cost um, in production $3.50, then we do not talk about hardware security. Then you have a, a low value device and then we are talking about, okay, do a software protection and making sure that um, the normal attacker or even an advanced attacker is not able to hack this device without uh, quite big effort. So I don't want to say the software solution is not good. You, you need a very experienced hacker to um, attack an encrypted software. It's not so easy. Right, okay. Uh, Michelle, there's a question about uh, the visibility and obfuscation of code execution and data in level one, level two caches uh, as part of the protection. Um, is there any sort of uh, thing you can do to protect the visibility in RAM and caches as well? Uh, well, the first thing would be to disable it. Um, that, that, uh, obviously, that's not necessarily a, that's a, what I call a Mr. Smarty Pants kind of answer because sometimes cache is absolutely necessary for uh, performance reasons. Right. Uh, in the case of highly secure uh, data where security is paramount, it will take over the, the performance aspect of things. We see the same concept in the safety type of application. You know, uh, self-driving cars, you want to make sure it's absolutely safe. So if there is a hardware consideration that would kind of make it unsafe, then maybe the hardware consideration will be pushed to the side, and, and in the case of cash, we might remove it. We do not, you know, in terms of software, have uh, the ability to protect or you know disregard or obfuscate whatever goes in the cache. So uh, that question is very valid because when we look at let's say data at rest, it's encrypted on the disk. It's not cached in memory, but it, some of it can be in the clear in the data cache at uh, various points in time. So uh, th this is a reality. A hardware solution actually helps you with that because the data is either clear or unclear, and all the, the, 
the data transfer goes through the special hardware, specialized hardware, and that helps a little bit. Uh, in terms of the code itself, um, there is nothing that I am aware of in software that we can do. I was even discussing with some experts that said they don't even have to have access to the device uh, from the you just put it in a machine and it can read whatever goes across the bus. Mind you, these are machines that cost millions and millions of dollars. So again, if you have enough money, you can always get to it. Way back when I used to deal with video games, copy protection, uh, we're talking in the uh, early 90s, late 80s, and guess what? No matter how much money a company puts in a copy protection for a game, there was always a way to break it. And so uh, uh, I think Marco said it, the, 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 the incentive for hacking a device is always going to be proportional to the value that you gain from doing it. You're not going to spend a million bucks to retrieve $10 worth of information. Right. Uh, so we have to look at it from a risk-reward standpoint. If that is so critical that you don't want any chance, then you will disable the cache if needed. Mm-hmm. Does that make okay. sense? Yep, I think so. Um, Unfortunately, that brings us to the conclusion of today's eCast. I want to thank Michelle and Marco for sharing their expertise in embedded security for IoT. Uh, We at Open Systems Media, Wind River, and Weeboo Systems also want to thank you, the audience, for attending today and contributing those excellent questions remotely. Thank you for attending, and have a great day.